Welcome to True Crime Review, an unflinching gaze into the depths of human depravity. The podcast covers current crime news, updates on cold cases and resources for research and investigation. True Crime Review often discusses disturbing and violent crimes. So listener discretion is advised. Welcome to episode 14 of the True Crime Review Podcast. This is a true crime audio episode, presenting primary source audio from the trial of Dennis Lynn Rader, who called himself BTK, which stands for Bind, Torture, Kill. This episode is actually the first of a two-part series on BTK and presents his courtroom confession. The next episode, episode 15, will be a standard episode including news updates and a cold case. Episode 16, our next true crime audio episode, will include Raider's own sentencing mitigation statement and, most importantly, several victim impact statements read aloud in court, in Raider's presence by the people whose lives were affected by Raider's evil. We go now to the June 27, 2005 confession of Dennis Raider, a.k.a. BTK. Mr. Raider, I need to find out more information. On that particular day, the 15th day of January, 1974, can you tell me where you went to kill Mr. Joseph Otero? Mm, I think it's 1834, uh, Edgemore. All right. Can you tell me approximately what time of day you went there? Uh, somewhere between 7 and 7.30. This particular location, did you know these people? No, that's... Uh, no, that was part of my, uh, I guess, my what you call fantasy. These people were... Uh, selected. All right. So you, okay. okay, you were engaged in some kind of fantasy during this period of time. Uh, yes, sir. All right. Now, when you use the term fantasy, is this something you were doing for your personal pleasure? Uh, sexual fantasy, sir. I see. So you went to this residence, and what occurred then? Well. <clears throat> uh, I had uh, did some uh, thinking on what I was going to do to uh, either Mrs. Otero or Josephine and uh, basically broke into the house or didn't break into the house, but uh, when they came out of the house, I came in and confronted the family and then we went from there. All right. Had you planned this beforehand? To some degree, yes. Uh, after I got in the house, it, well, I lost control of it, but it, it was, you know, in, back of my mind, I had some ideas what I was going to do, did but you, uh, I just, I basically panicked that first day, so. Beforehand, did you know who was there in the house? I thought Mrs. Otero and the two kids, the uh, two younger kids were in the house. I didn't realize Mr. Otero was going to be there. All right. How did you get into the house? I came through the back door, uh, kept the phone lines, uh, waited at the back door, had reservations about even going or just walking away, but Pretty soon the door opened and I was in. All right, so the door opened. Was it open for you? or did so- I think one of the kids, I think the uh, ju- uh, junior, or not junior, yes, the, uh, the young girl, uh, Joseph, opened the door. He probably let the dog out because the dog was in the house at that time. All right, when you went into the house, what happened then? Well, I confronted the family, uh, pulled a pistol, uh, confronted Mr. Otero, and asked him to, uh, you know, that I was there to basically, I was uh, wanted, uh, wanted to uh, get the car. I was hungry, food, I was wanted, and I asked him to lie down in the uh, living room. And uh, at that time, I realized that wouldn't be a really good idea. So I finally, the dog was a real problem, so I uh, asked Mr. Otero if he could get the dog out. So he had one of the kids put it out. And then I took him back to the bedroom. You took who back to the bedroom? Uh, the family, the bedroom. They have four members. All right, what happened then? At uh, that time, I tied him up. While still holding him at gunpoint? 
Well, in between tying and yes. Yeah. All right. After you tied them up, what occurred? Well, uh, they started complaining about uh, being tied up, and I re re-loosened the bonds a couple of times. Uh, tried to make Mr. Otero as comfortable as I could. Uh, apparently, had a cracked rib from a car accident, so I had him put a pillow down on his, for his head. Uh, had he put a, uh, I think he Parker or a coat underneath him. Uh, they, uh, you know, they talked to me about, uh, uh, you know, giving the car and whatever money. I guess they didn't have very much money, and uh, the, uh, there I realized that, uh, you know, I was already. I didn't have a mask on or anything. They already could ID me and uh, uh, made, a, made a decision to go ahead and, and uh, cut him down, I guess, or strangle him. All right. What did you do to Joseph Otero Sr.? Joseph Otero? Yeah, yeah. Joseph Otero Sr., Mr. Otero, the father. I uh, put a plastic bag over his head and then some cords and tightened it. And this was in the bedroom? Yes, sir. Did he, in fact, uh, suffocate and die as a result of this? Not right away. No, sir, he didn't. What happened? Uh, well, after that, I, uh, I did miss this Otero. Uh, I had never strangled anyone before, so I really didn't know how much pressure you had to put on a person or how long it would take. But Was she also tied up there in the yes, bedroom? Yes, uh -huh. yeah, both their hands and their feet were tied up. She was on the bed. Where were the children? Uh, well, uh, Josephine was on the bed, and uh, Junior was on the floor this time. So we're, we're talking, first of all, about Joseph Otero. So you had put the bag over his head and tied it, mm -hmm. and he did not die right away. Can you tell me what happened in regards to Joseph uh, He moved over real quick, like, and I think tore a hole in the bag, and I could tell that he was having some problems there. But at that time, the, the whole family just went, uh, they went panicked on me, so I, I worked pretty quick. I got what Mrs. Did you, you worked pretty quick. Well, what I mean, I, I, I strangled Mrs. Otero, and she went out, or passed out. I thought she was dead. She passed out. And I strangled uh, uh, Josephine. She passed out, or I thought she was dead. And uh, then I went over and uh, put a, uh, and then uh, put a bag on uh, uh, Junior's head, and uh, and then. Uh, if I remember right, uh, Mrs. Otero came back. Uh, she came back and... Uh, Sir, let me ask you about Joseph Otero Sr. You senior. indicated he had torn a hole in the bag. Mm -hmm. and what did you do with him then? I put another bag over it, or either that or a... If I recollect, I think I put a uh, either a cloth or a T-shirt or something over it, over his head, and then a bag, another bag. And then tighten it down. Did he subsequently die? Well, yes. I mean, I, I mean, I was. I didn't just stay there and watch him. Then I was moving around the room. But all right. So you indicated you strangled Mrs. Otero after you had done this. Is that correct? Now I went back and strangled her again, right. that, and that that finally killed her at that time. So this is in regards to count two. You had <laughs> first of all put the bag over Joseph Otero's head. Mm -hmm. He tore a hole in the bag. Mm -hmm. Then you went ahead. Did you strangle Mrs. Otero then? Okay. Or did you go first back? Of all, first of all, Mr. Otero was strangled, or a bag put over his head and strangled. Then I thought he was going down, and I went over and strangled Mrs. Otero. And I thought she was down. Then I strangled uh, uh, Josephine. I thought she was down. And then I went over to Junior and put the bag on his head. After that, Mrs. Otero woke back up, and uh, you know she was pretty upset. What's going on? So I came back, and uh, at that point in time, strangled her uh, for for the death strangle. At that time, with your hands or what? No, with a cord, with a with a rope. And uh, then I, uh, I think at that point in time, I redid Mr. Otero, put the bag over his head, uh, went over, and then took. Junior, oh, oh, before that, she asked me to uh, to, to uh, save her son, so I actually had taken the bag off, and then I was really upset at that point in time. So basically, when Mr. Otero was down, Mrs. Otero was down, I went ahead and, and uh, took uh, uh, Junior, I put another bag over his head and took him to the other bedroom. 
that what, time. What did you do then? Um, put a bag over his head. I put a, a cloth over his head, a T-shirt, and a bag so he couldn't tear a hole in it. And uh, he subsequently died from that. Wow. And then when I went back, uh, Josephine had woke back up. What did you do then? And I took her to the basement and eventually uh, hung her. Are you hung her in the basement? Yes, sir. Right. Did you do anything else at that time? Yes, I, uh, I had some sexual fantasies. But that was uh, after she was hung. All right. What did you do then? I went through the house, uh, kind of cleaned it up. Uh, it's called the right hand rule. You go from room to room. Uh, picked everything up. I think I took uh, Mr. Otero's watch. There, I guess I took a radio. I uh, I'd forgot about that, but apparently I took a radio. Why did uh, you take these things? I don't know. Uh, I have no idea. Just. Uh, what happened then? I uh, got the keys to the car. In fact, I had the keys, I think, earlier before that because I wanted to make sure I had a, a way of getting out of the house and uh, clean the house up a little bit, make sure everything's packed up and left through the front door. And uh, they went there, went over to their car and then drove over to uh, Dylan's, left the car there, and then eventually walked back to my car. All right. Now, sir, from what you have just said, I take it that the facts you've told me apply to both counts one, all of counts one, two, three, and four. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Rader. Yes. And that is originally, I believe, he indicated 1834 Edgemore. The address was actually 803 Edgemore. <coughs> all right, but I'd ask him for the third and central count. He indicated what had happened. I don't believe he. Exact address is important. All right, Mr. Rader, we will now turn to count five. In that count, it is claimed that on or about the fourth day of April, 1974, in Sedgwick County, Kansas, that you unlawfully killed Catherine Bright maliciously, willfully, deliberately and with premeditation by strangulation and stabbing, inflicting injuries from which she did die on April 4th, 1974. Can you tell me what occurred on that day? Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, I don't know how to exactly say that. I had many, what I call them projects. They were different people in the town that I followed, watched. Uh, Kathleen Bright was one of the next targets, I guess, as I would indicate. How did you select her? Uh, just driving by one day, and I saw her go in the house with somebody else, and I thought that's a possibility. There was many, many places in the area, um, College Hill. They're all over Wichita, but anyway, that's it. Just it was basically a selection process. Work toward it. If it didn't work, I just move on to something else. But in the in the, my kind of person, stalking and scrolling, you go through the. A trolling stage and then a stocking stage. She was in the stocking stage when this happened. Uh, All right, sir. So you identified Catherine Bright as a potential victim. Yes, sir. What did you do here in Sedgwick County then? Pardon? What did you do then here in Sedgwick County? Uh, on this particular day, yes. uh, I broke into the house and waited for her to come home. How did you break into the house? Uh, through the back door on the east side. All right, and you waited for her to come home. Where yes, did sir. you wait? Uh, in the house there, probably close to the bedroom. I walked to the house and uh, kind of figured out where I'd be if they came through. Um, All right. What happened then? Uh, she and uh, Kevin uh, Bright came in. I uh, wasn't expecting him to be there. Uh, and come find out, I guess, they were related. Uh, that time I uh, approached him and told him I was wanted in California, uh, needed some car, Basically the same thing that I told the Turtles, uh, kind of ease them, make them feel better, and proceeded to. I think I had him tie. I think I had him tie her up first, and then I tied him up, or vice versa. I don't remember right now. But that now let, time, let me ask. You mm -hmm. indicated you had some uh, items to tie these people with. Did you bring these items, both the Turtles and for this location? The Turtles, I did. Uh, I'm not really sure on the brights. Uh, there was some, I, when I ended up working with the police, there was some controversy on that. 
Probably more likely I did, but uh, if if I had brought my stuff and used my stuff, uh, Kevin would probably be dead today. Right. I'm not bragging on that. It's just a matter of fact. It's the bonds I've t bro uh, tied him up with that he broke them. So, and, that, uh, All right. and maybe same way with uh, same with Catherine. It was I got out of got out of hand. All right. Now you indicated that you believe you had Kevin tie Catherine up. Mm -hmm. Tell me what happened then. Okay. I moved. Uh, well, after I really can't remember, Judge, whether I had her tie him up or she tied him up. But anyway, I moved. Uh, Basically, I moved her to another bedroom, and he was already secure there by the bed. Uh, I tied his feet to the uh, bedpost, at the bottom of the bedpost, so he couldn't run. Uh, kind of tied her in the other bedroom, and then I came back to strangle him. And at that time, we had a fight. Were you armed with a handgun at that time also? Yes, I had a handgun. What happened when you I came back? I actually had two handguns. Uh, well, I started strangling the, either the... Uh, Barrett broke, or he broke his bonds, and he jumped up real quick like. I pulled my gun and quickly shot him. I hit him in the head. He fell over. Uh, I could see the blood, and as far as I concerned, he, you know, I thought he was down and uh, was out, and then went and uh, started to strangle uh, uh, Kath or Catherine. And uh, then we started fighting because uh, bonds weren't very good, and so back and forth we fought. Uh, you and Catherine? Yeah, we fought. Uh, and I got the best of her, and I thought she was going down, and then I could hear some movement in the other room. So I went back, and Kevin, uh, no, no, I thought she was going down, and I went back to the other bedroom where Kevin was at, and I tried to re-strangle him at that time, and he jumped up, and we fought, and, uh, and he about, at that time, about shot me because he got the other uh, pistol that was in my shoulder here. I had my magnum in my shoulder, so and really, shoulder I, holster. Hmm? Did you have it in a shoulder holster? Yes, and I had the magnum in my shoulder holster. The other one was a twenty-two, right. and we fought at that point in time. And uh, I thought it was going to go off. I jammed the gun, stuck my finger in the <coughs> in there, jammed it, and uh, I think he thought that was the only gun I had because once I either bit his finger or hit him or something got away, and I used the twenty-two and shot him one more time, and I thought he was down for good at that time. All right, so you shot him a second time. Yes, sir. What happened then? Uh, went back to uh, uh, finish the job on Catherine, and uh, she was fighting. Uh, and at, at that point in time, I've been fighting her. I just, and then I heard some. I don't know whether I uh, was loose, basically losing control. The uh, strangulation wasn't working on her, and I uh, used a knife on her. You say you used a knife on yeah. her. Yes. What did you do with the knife? I stabbed her. I think she said either stabbed two or three times, uh, either here or here. Maybe two back here and one here, or maybe just two times back and here. You were pointing to your lower back and your, your... Yeah, underneath the ribs. And your lower abdomen. Yeah, underneath the ribs, up, up under the ribs. So after you stabbed her, what happened? Uh, actually, I think at that point in time, well, it was a total mess. I didn't have control on it. Uh, she was bleeding. Uh, she went down. Uh, I think I just went back to check on Kevin, or at that basically same time I heard him escape. It could be one of the two. But all of a sudden the front door of the house was open and he was gone. And uh, or, Oh, i tell you what I thought. I thought the police were coming at that time. I heard the door open. I thought, no, that's it. And I stepped out there, and he I could see him running down the street. So I quickly cleaned up everything that I could and left. All right, no. Mr. Rader, you indicated that at the Oteros you did not have a mask on. Did you have a mask on at the Brights? No, no, I didn't. Uh -huh. All right, so what happened then? Uh, I tried, to, I had already had the keys to the cars. Uh, and I thought I had the right key to the right car. I ran out to their car, and I think it was a pickup out there. And I tried it, it didn't work. And uh, at that point in time, I was, he was gone running down the street. I thought, yeah, I'm in trouble. So I tried, it didn't work, so I just took off, ran, and went down, went east, and then worked back toward the WSU campus where my car was parked. All right, so you had parked your car at the Wichita State University yes, sir, campus? Yes, the campus, uh -huh. How far away were, uh, was the Bright's residence? Oh, I parked, uh, what is that, 13th? And they're, uh, let's see, they're, they were on 13th. Was it 17th? Yeah. Uh, I, was for, I was just about one block south of 17th where the car was. 
Uh, oh. there, there's a park there. I parked by that park. And then I walked to 13th to, to the Brights residence. So I basically ran back. All right. So you were able to get to your car and get away. Yes, sir. <laughs> now let's turn to count number six. In that count, they claim on March 17th, 1977, in Cedric County, Kansas, that you unlawfully killed Shirley Byann maliciously, willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation by strangulation, inflicting injuries from which she did die on March 17th, 1977. Can you tell me what you did on that day? As before, uh, Byann was a... Uh, actually, on that one, she was completely random. Uh, there was actually someone across from Dillon's was a potential target. Uh, it was called Project Green, I think. I had project numbers assigned to it. And that particular day, I uh, drove to Dillon's, parked in the parking lot, watched this particular residence, and then got out of the car and walked over to it. Uh, it's probably the police report, the address. I don't remember the address now. Knocked. Nobody, nobody answered it. So I was all keyed up, so I just started going through the neighborhood. I've been through the neighborhood before. I kind of knew uh, a little bit of the layout of the neighborhood. Uh, I've been through the back alleys, knew where some certain people live. Uh, while I uh, was walking down Hydraulic, uh, I met a, a young boy and uh, asked him if he ID some pictures. Uh, kind of was a rust, I guess, or roost, as you call it, and uh, kind of feel it out. And I uh, saw where he went. And I went to another address and knocked on the door. Nobody opened the door, so I just noticed where he went and went to that house, and we went from there. Now, you, you call these projects, uh, were these sexual fantasies also? Potential hits. Yeah, in my world, that's what I call them. All right. So They're you went... projects, hits. All right, and, and why did you have these potential hits? Was this to gratify some sexual interest? Or... Yes, sir. I had there. I had a lot of them, so it's just if one didn't work out, I just moved to another one. All right. So, as I'm to understand it, then on the 17th of March, 1977, you saw this little boy go into a residence, mm -hmm. and you tried another residence. <coughs> no one was there. You tried another residence. No one was there, so right, you went right, to the residence right, with the right, little boy. You know, and I watched. I watched where he went. What happened then? Uh, after I tried this one's residence, nobody came to the door. I went to this house where he went in, knocked on the door and told him I was a private detective, uh, showed him a picture that I had just showed the boy, and asked him if they could ID the picture. And at that time, I, I had the gun here, and I just kind of forced myself in. I just walked in, just opened the door, walked in, and then pulled what, the pistol. What gun? What pistol? Uh, 357 Magnum. So you only had one gun? With the <laughs> yes, sir. Uh -huh. What happened then? Uh, I told uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Plan that... Uh, I had a problem with uh, sexual fantasies that was going to tie her up and that uh, I might have to tie the kids up and that she would cooperate with us, cooperate with me at that time. Uh, we went back, uh, she was extremely nervous, I think she even smoked a cigarette, and we went back to uh, one of the back, back areas of the porch, explained to her that I had done this before. and. Uh, I think she was, at that point in time, I think she was sick because she had a night robe on. And I think if I remember right, she was she had been sick. And I think, I think she came out of the bedroom when I went in the house. So anyway, we went back to the her bedroom, and I proceeded to tie the kids up. And they started crying and got real upset. So I said, oh, this is not going to work. So we moved them to the bathroom. She helped me. And then I tied the door shut. We put some toys and uh, blankets and odds and ends in there for the kids, make them as comfortable as we could. Tied the, uh, we uh, tied one of the bathroom doors shut so they couldn't open it, and we shoved. She went back and helped me shove the bed up against the other bathroom door, and then I proceeded to uh, tie her up. Uh, she got sick, threw up, um, got her a glass of water, comforted her a little bit, and then I went ahead and tied her up, and then uh, put a bag, a bag over her head, and strangled her. All right. Was this a plastic bag also? Mm, yes, sir. I think it was, but I could be wrong on that. Put a bag it, it was something. I'm sure it was a plastic bag, yeah. Now you say you put a bag over her head and strangled her. What did you strangle her with? Uh, I actually, I think on that, I had tied, uh, tied her legs to the uh, bedpost and worked up with the rope all the way up, and then what I had left over, I looped over her neck. All right, so you used this uh, rope to strangle her? Yes, I think, I think it's the same one that I tied her body with. Right. What happened then? 
Well, the, uh, the kids were really banging on the door, hollering, screaming, and uh, and then the telephone rang, and they had talked about earlier that the neighbor was going to check on them, so I cleaned everything up real quick like and got out of there, left, and went back into my car. Now, when you say you cleaned everything Well, I mean, put my stuff, I had a briefcase, uh, whatever I had laying around, ropes, tape, cords, I threw that in there, my, you know, whatever, you know, that I had that I brought in the house. Had you brought that to the uh, bride residence also? Or? Now, there is some, there, I, I think there's some basic stuff, but uh, I don't remember bringing total stuff like I did to some of the others. Uh, Was this a kit that you had prepared? Yeah, I, yes, I called it my hit kit. All right, sir. You left the Bayan residence, and had you parked your vehicle near yeah, there? Yeah, still in the same parking lot there at Dillon's, huh. at uh, Hydraulic and... Uh, Harry Lincoln Lincoln yeah. Lincoln and, <coughs> Lincoln and uh, hydraulic. All right. In count seven, it is claimed that on the eighth day of December, nineteen seventy-seven, in Sedgwick County, Kansas, that you unlawfully killed a human being, that being Nancy Fox, maliciously, willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation by strangulation, inflicting injuries from which the said Nancy Fox did die on December eighth, nineteen seventy-seven. Can you tell me what you did on that day here in Sedgwick County? Nancy Fox was another one of the projects. Uh, when I was uh, trolling the area, I noticed her go in the house one night. Uh, sometimes, in, uh, anyway, I put her down as a potential victim. Um, uh, let me ask you one thing, Mr. Rader. You used that term when you were patrolling the area. What do you mean by that? It's called stalking or trolling. So you were not... Uh, working in any form or fashion. You well, just... I don't know if, you know, if you read much about serial killers, they go through what they call the different phases. Uh, that's one of the phases they go through as a, a, as a trolling stage. You're la basically, you're looking for a victim at that time. And that you could be trolling for months or years. But once you lock in on a certain person, then you become stalking. And that might be several of them, but you really home in on that person. Uh, they, they basically become the, that's, that's the victim. Or that's what you want to do. Mr. Ryan, he said trolling to the T, not a trolling. He did say trolling to the T. I thought he said trolling. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. No, sir. no, I wasn't working, sir. All right. No, this was, no, this was off, off, off my hours. All right. So you basically uh, identified Nancy Fox as one of your uh, projects. What happened then? Uh, at first, uh, she was uh, spotted, and then I did a little homework. I dropped by once to check the mailbox to see what her name was, uh, found out where she worked, uh, stopped by there once uh, at Hillsburg, and kind of sized her up. I, the more I knew about a person, the, the more I felt comfortable with it. So I did that a couple of times. And then I just selected a night, which was this particular night, to try it, and it worked out. All right. Can you tell me what you did on the night of December 8th, 1977? Now about two or three blocks away, I parked my car and walked to that residence. I uh, knocked, uh, knocked at the door first to make sure to see if anybody was in there because I knew she arrived home at a particular time from where she worked. Uh, nobody answered the door, so I went around to the back of the house, uh, cut the phone lines. I could tell that there wasn't anybody in the uh, north apartment. Uh, broke in and waited for her to come home in the kitchen. All right. Did she come home? Yes, she did. What happened? Uh, I confronted her. Uh, told her there I was a uh, had a problem, sexual problem that I would have to tie her up and have sex with her. Uh, she was uh, a little upset. Uh, we talked for a while. Uh, she smoked a cigarette. Uh, while the, while we smoked a cigarette, I went through her purse, uh, identifying some stuff. She finally said, uh, well, let's get this over with so I can go call the police. And I said, okay. And she said, can I go to the bathroom? And I said, yes. Uh, she went to the bathroom and came. And I told her when she came out to make sure that she was undressed. And uh, when she came out, I uh, handcuffed her. And uh, I don't really remember whether her. Sir? You handcuffed her? You had a pair of handcuffs? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. What happened then? Well, anyway, I, had her, I handcuffed her, had her lay on the bed, and then I tied her feet. And, uh, and then I, I, I was also undressed to a certain degree. And then I got on top of her 
and then I reached over, took either either feet were tied or not tied. But anyway, I took I think I had a belt. I took the belt and then strangled her with the belt at that time. All right. All right. After you had strangled her, what happened then? Okay. Uh, after I strangled her with the belt, I took the belt off and retied that with pantyhose, real tight. Uh, removed the handcuffs and uh, tied those with uh, with pantyhose. Can't remember the colors right now. Uh, I think I maybe retied her feet. What they had not already, they were probably already tied her feet were. Uh, and at that time, uh, uh, masturbated, sir. All right. Had you had sexual relations with her no, before? No, no. I told her I was, but I did not. So you masturbated, then what did you do? Uh, dressed and then went through the house, uh, took some of her personal items and kind of cleaned the house up, went through it, make checked everything, and then uh, left. All right. Well, he's established it was in Sedgwick County. I don't know exactly. What For purposes of uh, this, it's in Sedgwick County. Do you remember the address, Mr. Lady? Remember the address? Nine, nine thirteen or nine, nine oh three. No, I, I sure don't. I know it was on Persian, South oh. Persian. That's all. I don't. Here, which it was nine. It was nine something, sir. But I don't know the other digits. It's eight forty three. The address, as I said, is really not important as long as you remember it happened here in Wichita, Sutton County. Yes, sir. All right, sir. Let's turn to count eight. In count eight, it is claimed that on or about the 27th day of April 1985 to the 28th day of April 1985 in Sedgwick County, Kansas, it is claimed that you unlawfully killed a human being, Marine Hedge, maliciously, willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation by strangulation, inflicting injuries from which Marine Hedge did die on April 27, 1985. Can you tell me what occurred on that day? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, uh, kind of like the others, uh, she was chosen. Uh, I went through the different phases, uh, stocking phase, and since she lived down the street from me, I could watch the coming and going quite easily. Uh, on that particular date, I, uh, I uh, had a, a, a other commitment. I came back from that commitment, parked my car over at... Uh, Woodlawn and 21st Street uh, at Bowling Alley there at that time. Uh, before that, I dressed until I had some other clothes on, I changed clothes, I went to the bowling alley, uh, went in there, uh, the precincts of bowling, called a taxi, had a taxi take me out to Park City, uh, had my kit with me as a bowling bag. All right, that was Park City in Sedgwick County, yes, Kansas? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. All right, you had the taxi take you to Park City. What happened then? Uh, there I asked, I, I uh, pretended that I was a little uh, drunk. I just took I just took some beer and forced it around my mouth, and the guy could probably smell the alcohol on me. I asked, told him to let me out so I could get some fresh air, and I walked from where the taxi let me off over to her house. All right, where does she live? Uh, 62, <laughs> 42, 54. 6254? 6254. Right, North Independence. All right. All right. When you walked over there, what happened next? Well, as before, I was going to have uh, sexual fantasy, so I brought my hit kit, uh, and uh, lo and behold, her car was there. I thought, gee, she's not supposed to be home. So I very carefully snuck into the house, kind of like a cat burglar, and after checking the house, she wasn't there. So about that time, the doors rattled, so I uh, went, went back to one of the bedrooms and hid back there in one of the bedrooms. Uh, she came in with a male visitor. They were there for maybe an hour or so. Uh, he left. I waited till wee hours in the morning uh, and then proceeded to uh, sneak into her bedroom and uh, flip the lights on real quick like, or I think the bathroom lights. I just I didn't want to flip her lights on, and, and she screamed, and I jumped on the bed and strangled her manually. All right. Now, were you wearing any kind of disguise or mask at this time? No, no. You indicated this woman lived down the street from you. Did she know you? Uh, casually, we'd uh, walk by and wave. Uh, she she liked to work in her yard as well as I liked to work. It's just a neighborly type thing. It wasn't anything 
personal, I mean, just a neighbor. All right, so she was in her bed when you turned on the lights in the bathroom? Yeah, the bathroom, yeah, just to, so I could get some light in there. All right, what did you do then? Oh, I manually strangled her when she started to scream. So you but, used your hands? Yes, sir. And you strangled her? Did she die? Yes. All right, what did you do then? Uh, after that, uh, since I was in the uh, sexual fantasy, I uh, went ahead and uh, stripped her and uh, probably went ahead and uh, I'm not sure if I tied her up at that point in time. But anyway, uh, she was nude and I put her on a blanket, uh, went through her purse, some personal items in the house, uh, figured out how I was going to get her out of there. Uh, eventually uh, moved her to the trunk of the car. Uh, took the car over to uh, Christ Lutheran Church. Uh, this is with the older church. And uh, I took some pictures of her. All right. You took some photographs of her. What kind of camera did you use? Uh, poor Lord. Did you keep those photographs? Yes, the police probably had them. All right. All right what happened then? Uh, that was it. I that went, uh, took, uh, she went through, I tied it, she was already dead, so I took uh, pictures of her in different forms of bondage. And that's probably what got me in trouble was the bondage thing. So anyway, that's the, probably the, the main thing. But anyway, after that, I uh, moved her back out to the car, and then uh, we went east on 53rd. All right, what occurred then? Sir? What happened then? Oh, uh, trying to find a place to hide her, hide the body. Did you find a place? Yes, yes I did. Where? Uh, couldn't tell you without looking at a map, but it was on 53rd, uh, Queen Greenwich maybe. Maybe, what's what's the other one, Queen Green, Greenwich? Rock. Man. Web. Queen, I think between Wed and, Web and Greenwich, I found a, a ditch, a low place on the north side of the road and hit her there. All right, you say you hit her there? Well, there were some there were some trees, some brush, and I laid that over the top of her body. All right, so you removed the body from the car, put her in the ditch, and then laid some, some brush over the body. Yes, sir. All right. Sir, in count nine, it is claimed on or about the 16th day of September 1986 in Cedric County, Kansas, that you unlawfully killed a human being, Vicki Wegerly maliciously, willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation by strangulation, inflicting injuries from which the said Vicki Wagerly did die on September 16, 1986. Can you tell me what you did here in Sedgwick County on that day that makes you believe you are guilty? As, uh, again, Vicki was, Wagerly was another potential victim. I went through those different phases, uh, locked in on her, as I would call it, and uh, decided that I would try that date. I used a ruse as a uh, telephone repairman to get in their house. Uh, drove there in my own personal car uh, around lunchtime, during lunch hour, or approximately that time. It was earlier in the morning that. And uh, put my, I actually went somewhere else and changed uh, changed my clothes, what I, what I call my uh, hit clothes. And, hit uh, clothes? Hit clothes. Uh, basically different, you know, things that I'd need to get rid of later. Not not the same kind of clothes that I had on. I, I don't know what other better word to use it. Uh, crime clothes or hit clothes. I just call them hit clothes. Uh, anyway, I walked from my car as a telephone uh, repairman. As I walked there, I donned the telephone helmet. I had a briefcase. Went to one other address just to kind of size up the house. I'd walked by it a couple times, but I wanted to check it a little bit more. Uh, as I approached it, I could hear a piano sound. And uh, went to this other door, knocked on them, and told them I was, that we were recently working on telephone repairs in the area. And, uh, and went to her went to her, and knocked on the door and asked her if I could come check her telephone lines inside. Did she allow you in? Yes, she did. What happened then? I uh, went over and uh, found out where the telephone was, uh, simulated that I was checking the uh, telephone. I had a make-believe instrument, and uh, after she was looking away, I, I drew a pistol at her and asked her if she'd go back to the bedroom with me. Is this the same 357 Magnum you'd used? No, this, this was a different one. Different pistol. Are you asked her to go back to the bedroom with you after drawing a pistol on her? Yes, sir. What happened then? Uh, I told her, we went back to the bedroom, I told her I was going to have to tie her up. Uh, she was very upset, and I think we I used some material that was in, uh, and that, that's another thing, I'm not sure, but I, I think I used the material that they had in their bedroom, 
And after I tied her hands, uh, she broke that and we started fighting. And we fought quite a bit, back and forth. All right, she was physically fighting you? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. What happened then? Uh, finally got the hand on her and got a, a, a nylon sock and started strangling. So you wrapped the stocking around her neck? Yes. Mm -hmm. What happened then? Uh, I finally gained uh, gained on her and, and, and put her down, and I thought she was dead, but apparently she wasn't. But uh, after after she was down and not moving anymore, I, I rearranged her clothes a little bit and took some quick photos, I think three of them, if I remember. And then uh, after that, I, there was a lot of commotion. Uh, she had mentioned something about her husband coming home, uh, so I got out of there pretty quick. The dogs were raising a lot of cane in the back. Uh, the doors and the windows were all open to the house. A lot of noise when we were fighting. So I left pretty quickly after that. Put everything in the briefcase and had her, I'd already gone through her uh, purse and got the keys to the car and used her car for my getaway car. All right, now you indicate that you thought that she was dead. Did you discover later that she was not dead? Yes, I guess the paramedics uh, arrived and they tried to attempt to re relieve her, or revive her, and that, that failed. I don't know if she died there or on the way to the hospital or at the hospital. I don't recollect. But you later found out that she did die as a result of your strangulation. Yes. Now, sir, let's turn to count 10. In that count, it's claimed that on or about the 18th day of January 1991 to the 19th day of January 1991 in the county of Sedgwick, state of Kansas, that you did then and there unlawfully kill a human being, that being Dolores E. Davis maliciously, willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation by strangulation inflicting injuries from which the said Dolores E. Davis did die on January 19, 1991. Mr. Rader, please tell me what you did here in Sedgwick County, Kansas on that day that makes you believe you're guilty. Uh, that particular day I had some commitments. I left those, uh, went to one place, changed my clothes, went to another place, uh, Parked my car, finally made arrangements on my hit kit, my clothes, and then walked to that residence. Uh, after spending some time at that residence, uh, it was very cold at night. Uh, had reservations about going in. I, I had cased the place before, and I really couldn't figure out how to get in, and she was in the house, so I finally just uh, selected a, a, a concrete block and threw it through the plate glass window on the east and came on in. All right, where is this residence located? It's on Hillside, but I couldn't give you address. I know it's probably 61, probably 62 something. Oh, 62 something. North or south? North. North Hillside. All right, so you used a concrete block to break the window? Mm hmm. Plate glass window, patio door. Mm -hmm. What happened then? Uh, noise. I just went in. Uh, she came out of the bedroom and thought that a car had hit her house. And I told her that I was, uh, I used the, the roofs of uh, being wanted. Uh, I was on the run, I needed food, car, warmth, warm up, and uh, and I asked her, I handcuffed her, and uh, kind of talked to her, told her that I would like to get some food, get her keys, her car, and uh, kind of rest assured, you know, walk, talk with her a little bit, and calmed her down a little bit, and, uh, and then eventually I checked, uh, I think she was still handcuffed, I uh, went back and checked out where the car was. Uh, Stimulated getting some food, odds and ends in the house that I like I was leaving. And then went back and uh, removed her handcuffs and, uh, and then tied her up and then and then eventually strangled her. Or did you say eventually strangled her? Well, after I tied her up, I went through some things in the room there and then and then strangled her. Or did you say you went through, were you looking for something? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a personal items, yes. I took some personal items from there. Did you take personal items in every one of these incidents? Uh, I did on the hedge. Uh, I don't remember anything of uh, Vicky's place. The Ocheros, we got the watch and the radio. I don't think I did any in Brights. Uh, Vians, no, I don't think so. Fox, yes, I took some things from Fox. It was hit and miss. All right. But uh, probably if it, if, it was, if it was a control situation where I had more time, I took something. But if it, if it was a confusion and other things, I didn't as I was trying to get out of there. All right. So in regard to the Davis matter, you went around the room, took a few personal things. What did you do then? Uh, strangled her. What did you strangle her with? Pantyhose. All right. What happened then? 
Uh, I kind of like uh, Mrs. Hedge. Uh, I already figured out my, I had a you know, plan on leaving and uh, tr put her in a blanket and drug her to the car and put her in the trunk of the car. So you were able to strangle her to death with these pantyhose? Yes, sir. All right, you put her in your car? In her car. In car. Her, her car. car. Uh -huh. trunk. The trunk of her car. Uh -huh. What happened then? Uh, I really had a commitment I needed to go to, so I moved her to one spot, took her out of her car. This gets complicated. <laughs> then the stuff I had, clothes, gun, whatever, I took that to another spot in her car, dumped that off. Okay. Then took her car back to her house, uh, left that, let me think now. Okay, in the interim, uh, I took her car back to her house. In the interim, I realized that I had lost one of my guns. I dropped it somewhere. So I was we saw it, trying to figure out where my gun was. So I went back in the house, realized I had dropped it when I went in the, when I broke the plate glass window. It dropped and fell on the floor right there, and I found it right there. So that solved that problem. Anyway, I went back out, uh, threw the keys, uh, checked the car real quick, quick like, uh, and threw the keys up on top of the roof of her house, walked from her car back to my car, took my car, drove it back, and I either dropped more stuff off or I picked her up and put them in my car. And then I drove up uh, northeast of uh, Sedgwick County and dropped her off underneath the bridge. So all of these incidents, these 10 counts, occurred because you wanted to satisfy a sexual fantasy, is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Does any party desire any further uh, matters to be put on the record at this time? No, Your Honor. All right, you may be seated, Mr. Ray. Oh. I will find that you, Dennis L. Rader, have knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily waived your constitutional rights and entered your pleas of guilty. I will find that you understand the nature of the charges and the consequences of your pleas. Based upon your statements to the court, I will find there are factual bases for each of these pleas of guilty. I will accept these pleas of guilty and adjudge you, Dennis L. Rader guilty of murder in the first degree in count one, a class A felony, murder in the first degree in count two, a class A felony, murder in the first degree in count three, a class A felony, murder in the first degree in count four, a class A felony, murder in the first degree in count five, a class A felony, murder in the first degree in count six, a class A felony. Murder in the first degree in count seven, a class A felony. Murder in the first degree in count eight, a class A felony. Murder in the first degree in count nine, a class A felony. And murder in the first degree in count ten, a class A felony. This has been episode 14 of the True Crime Review Podcast. This was part one of a two-part true crime audio series about Dennis Rader, a.k.a. BTK. This episode was the killer's courtroom confession. The next true crime audio installment of the True Crime Review podcast will be episode 16. It will include Rader's sentencing mitigation statement and, most importantly, several victim impact statements made in court by those affected by the evil serial killer's homicidal acts. Thanks for listening to this episode of True Crime Review. Find us on Facebook and Instagram at True Crime Review, on Reddit at r slash True Crime Review and on Twitter at True Crime Rev. Go to truecrimereview.net slash subscribe to subscribe and get all of our new episodes when they're released. Please also leave a review in iTunes, 5 stars would be awfully nice if you think they're deserved, or wherever you listen to the podcast because those help us move up the charts and get more listeners. The theme music is Our Planet is Lost, by Entropy Audio. Find more at entropyaudio.bandcamp.com. Transition music is from Ophelia's Dream by Ben Sound. Find more at bensound.com. This is your host Joe, well, 
a synthetic voice speaking for Joe, signing off of this episode of True Crime Review. Until next time remember, families deserve truth, and victims deserve voices.